This is Jonathan Agar here for Pro Boxing Fans, joined by Gareth A. Davis. We're here, We've done the press conference for Shields against Marshall this Saturday night. Gareth, what did you take from both Clarissa and Savannah from the press conference? Well, they've both um, got utter self-belief in themselves and, um, you know, I still think when you look at the body of work that Clarissa Shields has clearly um, produced more and is highly successful. But this is Savannah Marshall's moment. I like the quips that Savannah and Peter Fury had for Clarissa Shields, who's a much more adept kind of gunslinger with her mouth, isn't she really? So I thought they were good today. I thought they responded well. I thought all the stuff about the quote necklace was fun. Um, there was a lot of repartee. As I say, they both project like they really believe in themselves. And for that reason, it's a hard fight to pick. I mean, stylistically, I think, I know we'll come on to that, but Clarissa Shields does more in a fight. She's busier. Savannah hasn't had to do quite so much and she generally ends up hurting her opponents and there's not a lot coming back. I think Clarissa's going to hit Savannah more than she's ever been hit in a pro career. I think it makes it a very interesting fight. Um, but I thought it was good today. It was a really good turnout. Bob Arum there, Andre Ward there, Timothy Bradley there, Yaren Anderson there, Top Rank bringing out and ESPN bringing their people. Really good field to press conference. All you lot there, I say you lot, all the social media world, brilliant, um, strong resonance, 20 women here today on the cards, some great storylines, um, three different set piece press conferences, I thought it went on a bit long, but I'm glad they've done it in London, I'm glad I've heard there's 15,000 tickets sold, feels like a big event, it's, it's a new type of event, but it's a big event. Looking at this build up, and I don't know if you agree with me, but I was speaking to Johnny Nelson about this just earlier. Is Clarissa more motivated for this fight because people believe that she can be beat by Savannah Marshall? Is that why she's going at her in press conferences? Is that what, where her motivation's coming from? These are two elite fighters. Savannah's very strong, very powerful, arguably one of the biggest punches in women's boxing. And um, she has beaten. The, the, you can't make any bones about it. Yes, it was in the amateurs. Yes, it was 11 years ago. But she has beaten Clarissa Shield in the amateurs. And Savannah was number one in the world at middleweight at the time. She was the number one amateur in the world. She went into the London Olympics. This formidable games that I covered myself that was amazing to have women for the first time. That, that um, wherever it was in the XL, I think it was the XL, yeah, it was the XL. It was sold out every day, 10,000 people for every session. It was amazing. Savannah Marshall suffered terrible um, disappointment at those games. But Clarissa Rose, as a teenager, 16, 17 as she was, won the Olympic gold, did the same in Rio. Savannah has a victory over her. I mean, as Clarissa said today, I don't know why everyone's holding on to 11 years. She had a victory over me as an amateur. Big deal. It isn't a big deal in lots of ways, but in both their minds, it's a big deal. Clarissa Shields wants to put the record straight. She wants the final belt. She wants all those belts, plus the, the Ring Magazine belt. Savannah, as she said to me several times, a couple of times on just exclusive little interviews with her on Zoom over the last few months, this is my big opportunity. This is my moment. And I think it's come at a great time. That's why I asked the pre at the press conference today, is there a rematch? I do feel there's going to be a need for a, for a rematch in this fight, if not a trilogy. Because those two-minute rounds that women fight go really fast. These two are not going to go at it toe-to-toe. -to -toe. I cannot see that. I think it'll be a boxing match. And it'll be over quickly, and I think it'll be tight, and people have different opinions on it. And I think it'll go the way of Shields, controversially. Um, but I think they'll want to do it again. I just do. And if it goes the way of Marshall, they will definitely do it again. So, so you don't think that sort of Marshall's going to assert herself in terms of what people are looking at this fight in terms of a knockout percentage? You don't feel that... She, you feel that they're going to sort of try and box this fight? It's a very close fight, however you look at it. Um... Savannah Marshall's got a really good jab um, and, and she's good on the outside. She's got perfect, it's the Fury style. She gets hard on the inside, lands heavy shots. She's not a volume puncher. She's going to have to up her work rate. But if someone's jabbing you, you can't do anything else. She's got to win the battle of the jab in this fight and not get Caressa get in and throw those haymakers and throw uppercuts and 
bury into her and get busy. But Carasso will be looking to close the distance and let her hands go. She won't fear Savannah Marshall's power, I don't think. She'll respect it. She won't fear it. Um, she's been down before and got up. Um, but I just think Savannah's going to get hit more than she's ever been hit before. And I think we'll find out things about her in this fight as well. It's a fascinating fight. But I, I, I think it'll be a little bit cagey early on. Ten years of separation between having been in the ring together and knowing about each other. They're going to have to control their emotions, um, particularly Clarissa. So, um, you want to get yourself a microphone stand so you don't have to change hands all the time. It is painful. But... Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you'll get there. Um, not as painful as being punched in the face for a living, probably. That is definitely true. Um, <clears throat> it's just a fascinating fight. It's come at a really good time. They're both elite amateurs. There's very few people around their level. They could both go up to super middle and wait and fight HH Diva, of course, and then come back down and fight each other. HH Diva is a brawler. She's, she'd admit that. We saw that with Clarissa and HH Diva. In fact, you go back to that fight, and they both hit each other hammer and tongs for six or eight rounds shields yeah. and um, on her debut on, it. on her debut it was on the ward Kovalev undercard and T-Mobile I was there that night it was amazing you know half an hour after their fight where they went at it hammer and tongs they're both in their dresses all done up in their heels going out with their mates not a bruise on them you know not a mark on them you know they're extraordinary people but yeah it's a great it's a great main event on Saturday night and your thoughts on the co-main event Mayer against Baumgold and it seems to be as much interest in that as the main event. Yeah, I'm rightly so. Um, Meyer against Bam Garden is a brilliant fight. Almost all the super featherweight belts. I think it's Meyer's fight to lose if she boxes stylistically in the right way. Keeps, you know, she's three or four inches taller, isn't she? The Bam Garden, who's the explosive athlete, who's the power athlete, who's the person with all the power. Um, I think Maya, Maya ought to win it on paper on points, but don't write off Bam Gardner because she's so explosive. If Maya gets drawn into a toe-to-toe -to -toe fight, rather like she did against Maeve Hamadouche and they, they went at it, there could be problems for her. Um, but yeah, I think it's more likely to be the showstopper that fight, yeah, if anything. Fury Joshua has been on everyone's lips this week. Uh, I think, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you've said on record you feel Joshua should have some more fights before fighting Fury. Just explain why. Well, I mean, it, you know, it makes sense. I mean, he's just lost two on the bounce. We, we saw how he was. You were out there with us, weren't you, in Saudi? I wasn't, actually. Oh, you weren't? No. I thought I remember seeing you there. Um, you know, it, 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 was a, it was a difficult night for him after he lost. It was a difficult night for him in general, but he put up a great performance. I think he put up a great performance. It was very close fight up until the 10th round I had him 5-4 and people can dispute that or whatever they want but that's it looked close in the arena to that point and Usyk took the fight away from him late um, it doesn't make sense it's an end game fight for him to, to fight Fury in December even if Fury agrees today to December the 17th having put out November the 26th and December the 3rd I think as the offer um, it doesn't make sense. He needs to rebuild, go and knock out a couple of people, have a couple of good performances, fight Dillian White, fight Deontay Wilder maybe. The Fury fight will always be there. Um, there's not enough time for him to get ready, frankly. It's very unwise. Take it now. Because if he did lose or he did get knocked out, it's very difficult to see where he goes from there, where he actually goes from there. And he's got new paymasters in zone, who've offered him a multi-fight, multi-year deal. I'm talking business here, I'm talking from his perspective. If I was his promoter, I'd be saying, stay away. Why isn't Usyk fighting Fury in December? Because he's not ready, because he needs time. And Joshua needs time, and he, but he needs to rebuild in my view. There's the other side of it with people saying, here's the chance to be a three-time world champion straight away. You don't have to rebuild. It doesn't work like that, I'm afraid. And I, I don't think it does anyway. Well, I know we're in new times and things are changing all the time. But I just think it's very unwise to take that fight now. And I think it's like I was a 1% or 2% chance that that fight is going to get made over the next 24 hours. I cannot see it. As you say, a counter to that point is you say the fight is always there, which it very much could be. But if Fury, this fight doesn't happen, Fury fights Usyk twice. twice, you're looking at potentially 2024. Is there a chance we wouldn't see this if we don't see it now? No, I don't think so. Well, there's a chance. Of course there is. There's a chance we might not. But there's no point just doing it for the sake of it right now. Fury would love it right now. 
it's good for Fury. It's not good for Joshua, in my view. And I think they'll they'll end up. You'll end up with this fight collapsing, or the prospect of this fight collapsing, which it was always likely to. Um, even if Fury comes out today and says December 17th, I do not see Joshua and Eddie Hearn accepting it. I hope I'm wrong. I really do hope I'm wrong. And we do see this fight in December. But I don't think it's the right time for Anthony Joshua to take this fight. A couple of days ago, Eddie Hearn said that he had his doubts about how serious the offer is, uh, given the fact that he feels that Fury could say, well, if he doesn't take the fight, well, you didn't want to fight. And, you know, Joshua would get blamed for not taking it. Do you see that argument? Yeah, there's a lot of fighter and promotes, promoter speak here, and there's a lot of playing games with each other, and there's a lot of jeopardy going on, and there, you know, there's a lot of board games going on here, definitely. Um, they can say what they like. We know that Joshua would take the Fury fight. He'd know, we know he wouldn't run away from it. Um, he's a fighter. He'd fight anyone. Um, he'd fight Fury three times if he lost the first two. Um, no, I think it, it's a, it's a, it was a clever move by Fury on Monday, calling out Joshua and then specifying the dates and then saying it's a 60-40 split. It's games. It's games. Just last one on this. If it does happen, how do you think it works from a broadcast perspective? I spoke to Bob Arum earlier and he said Fury still has some fights left with them. So ESPN, you got Joshua on the zone. Can it be, and obviously Fury on BT here, can it be a joint? joint well, venture yeah it's a complex one but I think BT Sport and DAZN would have to share the pay-per-view here um, and I don't know how they do it in America obviously it's like you say it's the ESPN deal I don't know how they do it maybe they get the re- zone get the rest of the world wide but not enough time for all of this exactly I mean it took eight and a half months for them not to have the fight in the end they were getting close weren't they uh, for Fury and, and Joshua in the in 20 God, when was that? 2021, up to August last year. That took months of back and forth. And I think they're more aligned now in terms of being able to get it done. But you can't get a fight of this, mate. Two, two big companies can't merge together in a week. They can't. So they could get the preliminary deals over the line, but I don't think we'll get further than that. Well, we're we'll not seeing that one. Last one. And I, one more, one more. Just away from that, uh, I saw you at the YouTube card the other week, KSI yeah. Swarms. I just wondered what you think boxing that we watch, what can it learn from an event like that? Obviously, those guys have uh, the big followings going into it and are able to attract 20,000 people like that. But, you know, what can be done? Because sometimes you don't often see the O2 sold out anymore, 20,000. Is there anything what we watch can learn? Well, I'll add to what you said there. You never see 17,000 people in at 7 o'clock and a queue all the way to the bus station outside the O2 arena, really orderly and no drinkers. And it was a very young audience. It was a brilliant audience to be around. It was a great experience, frankly. And I, you know, I had the interviewer job on the night for, I was doing the broadcast for Talk Sports. And it was great to meet this young generation of, of YouTubers and influencers and people that might have a go at boxing. Oh, there was tremendous atmosphere. What, do they, what, what should we learn? You need a following. And, 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 and what we did learn is, people love the drama of fight sports and, and We've learned that these people are influencing their spheres of music and entertainment and YouTubing and gaming. They pick boxing. Why? Because there's so much drama involved. Because there's so much theatre in it. Because it's so immediate. It has great impact. It's it's visceral as well, you know, it's primordial. Um, And and they know that and and, and they, they all gave, they gave what they had. You know, it was like boxing until the bell rang, basically. Um... With a, with a more appreciative atmosphere and, and a little bit more applause, but it was like it was a cauldron in there at times. It was great to be at it. I don't think we should knock those guys being in our milieu, um, but I but I think we just have to be careful. We don't blur the lines too much and call it proper boxing. Or when when an influencer or a YouTuber or a celebrity boxer starts to get a bit better that we start to call them a proper boxer. And we've got that problem with Jake Paul, that he's getting better. He's definitely getting better. And he's like, is he, you know, I said this analogy a couple of times. You walked him into a gym and no one knew who he was. And you said to a trainer in an amateur boxing gym, can you do anything with this guy? They'd go, yeah, 
probably can actually, might be able to turn him into an area titleist, you know? Because he's got something, big, strong guy, appetite for it. So we just have to be careful about blurring the lines. But I really enjoyed the experience. Partly because it's being around young people from a different, um, from a different uh, world. And, and I think they translated well to putting on the cloak of boxing, if you like. It was a great event to be at. Gareth A. Davis, thanks very much for giving pro boxing fans some time and uh, I'll let you get back to your work. Appreciate Thank you very much, always a pleasure.